Okay, welcome. So, um, to this lecture, and as you can see, the title for this is called the Real Spectral Theorem. Okay, so the Real Spectral Theorem is a big one. It's a very famous one, and it's also a very important one. It's also a very hard one. Okay, and linear algebra. So, um, we're gonna work with uh linear product spaces with operators, right? We've been doing that, and now. We're gonna also work with the eigenvalues of uh, operators in linear uh, linear spaces, inner product spaces. So before that, some definition is that we say so we're given a vector space and an operator. A subspace is said to be invariant under T. Is to say that W and W implies T W and W. So basically, it means that T W is in W, right? So this is called an invariant under T. So under T, it won't change, right? Because T under W, it is still contained in W. So it is called invariant under T. And here's a lemma. So it basically states that given an inner product space such that uh, a joint exists and is self-adjoint, and we pick the vector space, uh, suppose a subspace of V such that is invariant under T, then the W perp is also invariant under T. So W invariant under T implies W perp is under T, given that T is self-adjoint. And the proof is also straightforward. So say that, okay, given V, if V is in W perp, right, and for any W and W, right, we, we know that it is self-adjoint, right, so we can use uh, this equality. And because V is in W perp, right, V is in W perp, and TW is in W because W is invariant under T, right? So this should gives you zero, which means that TVW is equal to zero, right? So this means that TV is in W perp, right? Because for in W, TVW, uh, TV with W in a product gives you zero, which means that TV is in the W perp. And V is in W perp. So V is W perp, TV is in W perp. So W perp is also invariant under T. And here's a remark that given T is self-adjoint, W is invariant under T, then the restricted operator T on W, right, is a linear operator on W, right, because W is invariant under T, so we can restrict its domain on W, so it becomes a linear operator on W. And it also, and we see that the restricted operator, right, because um, T is self-adjoint, and we see that the restricted operator is also self-adjoint, and we have this formula. So here's an easy remark that is easy to be checked, so I will just skip here. And here we're going to move on to another lemma, and this lemma requires um, some calculus knowledge, uh, especially and some metric topology. So if you don't know what's happening, just accept it, because it is, like, proven. So given in the product space over R and finite dimensional vector space such that uh, an operator that is self-adjoint, we let lambda be the maximum of the norm of SV where V is taken on uh, the unit circle. So V some unit circle, right? Because all the norm is equal to one. So we let lambda be the maximum of this. Okay. Then lambda or negative lambda is an eigenvalue of s let me put it here okay so basically uh we can let lambda be the maximum of sv norm sv norm where v is taken on the unit uh, circle right so first we have to say that, well, the maximum exists, right? This is the first thing we have to prove, is that this such lambda exists, right? This maximum exists. We have to prove it first. And the proof of this requires calculus, okay? So to prove lambda exists, first we fix an orthonormal basis of V, right? And uh, by Graham Schmidt, right? And for any V, we can write it as a linear combination, right? And... If the norm of V is equal to 1, the norm squared is also equal to 1. And when we compute the norm squared, 
we realize the norm squared it is equal to what t1 squared plus tn squared right which means that ti are in r so those t1 to tn we can map we can uh, view this as a point in rn right and this should be sn minus 1 rigorously okay um t1 tn is an sn minus 1 this is a unit circle right the unit circle such that x and rn such that um the norm in rn right is equal to 1 so this norm right now we are considering the euclidean norm which is the familiar norm you've been working with right this is the this is the one right unit circle right unit circle so which means that um right if we have if we require v the norm of v is equal to one based on this we see that the coefficients ti's they're on the unit circle in an rn okay and we further we can compute um the value of sv squared well sv by linearity right we, by linearity we can take this in front and uh, and again, by the linearity of uh, inner product, right, we can, and is, uh, if it's, it should be conjugate, but it doesn't matter because we're in R, right? So we have a T I T J, so and S C I S E J. So S C I and S E J's, right, are constants, right? They're in, they're in R. So we let alpha i j denote this uh, scalar, right? So it is just, S V squared is really just this, this expression, right? So notice we have a bijection between this set and the unit circle in Rn, right? Because for each uh, each point V such that V equal to one, right? We have this, which, which gives that the corresponding coefficient, which gives a point in Sn uh, minus one. Right, and conversely, if we fix the point in S n minus one, we consider their uh right, their linear combination with the bases right, and we see that well v v norm squared is equal to this, but this is equal to one, so v is equal to one right conversely. So here we have a bijection between this, so, we can view the function that takes v to S v squared. Right. We view the function takes v to s v squared. So basically, a function that takes that takes from v to a map from v to um, reals, right? For a function that takes from R n, R n, R n to reals, right? Because for each v. Right, we can correspond to a point here, and s v square, it is precisely equal to this, right? So, so we can just look at this function, and this function is a multinomial, and we by calculus, multivariable calculus, we know that multi multinomial is a continuous function, right? And whatsoever it is continuous on the set s n minus one, but S n minus one, this set, right? It's a compact set. It's a compact set, right? It's a compact set, which means that by extreme value theorem, right, continuous function on a compact set, uh, exit attains its maximum, right? So there exists a point such that v naught is equal to this and s v naught, right? The the function value which is equal to this. Uh, is the maximum, right? Attains a maximum on this. So, um, we let we let lambda defined as the square root of this, which is again the maximum of this, right? Because this is the maximum of this square, but trivially we have to take square root is again the maximum of this. Because they're all non-negative numbers, they're all non-negative, right? So we can take square roots. Right? So, okay. So first, we prove that the lambda exists. 
Now the first claim is that we have this inequality for this lambda, right? We have this inequality for any v in the vector space. So let's just check it. If it's, uh, if it's zero vector, then trivially holds, right? V uh, zero, zero, right? Now, if v is non-zero, we can scale it to a unit vector. If we scale it to a unit vector, we can apply this, uh, we can apply this condition, right? We scale it to a unit vector, unit vector, so lambda should be greater or equal to this, right? And by linearity of S, we have this, right? So we move it over here, which gives the desired inequality. So the claim one is proven. We have this for any V and V. Now, claim two such is, is that we have S square V naught is equal to lambda square V naught. S square V naught is S of S of V naught, okay? S of S of V naught. I mean, I mean, at this point, like, the only way to interpret the product of operators is by composition. So to prove this equality, we use Cauchy-Schwarz when the equality holds for S square V and V naught. S square V naught and V naught. So what it means, what I mean here is that, um, we're gonna apply Cauchy squares. Okay, so first, say, um, remember the Cauchy Schwartz is that x, y less than equal to x times y, right? And the equality holds if and only if, equality holds if and only if x is equal to alpha y, right? Right? So, First, we're going to show the Cauchy Schwartz with equality holds with this. So, first of all, this inner product, right? Um, because, you know, S is self adjoint, right? S is a self adjoint operator. S is a self adjoint operator. So, we can, we can move it here. This gives you this. And as V0 squared is lambda squared, which is greater than zero, right? So, if this is greater than equal to zero, then the absolute value of it is equal to itself, okay? And we're going to compute the, the norm x times norm y, right? Norm x times norm y. This, remember v naught, this is equal to one. Equal to this. This is equal to this, right? But view this as a vector w. So by claim one, s of w, lambda w, right? And this is equal to lambda again, so lambda squared. So this is less than or equal to lambda squared, right? But lambda squared is equal to this, right? And we also have this by, so so. Um, the other direction, right? This is less than this by Cauchy-Schwarz. And, and uh, this, less than lambda square, lambda square equal, equal, equal to this is the other direction of the inequality, which gives the equality of Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which we can conclude that they're linearly dependent. And we just need to verify this alpha is equal to lambda squared. Okay, so uh, uh, we know that, okay, uh, this is equal to lambda squared, right? So lambda squared is equal to this. This is equal to Right, we substitute in lamb, uh, alpha v naught v naught, and remember v naught is a unit vector, so lambda square equals to alpha. Thus, we have this. Okay, so we finished the second claim. And okay, so we see that okay by by the second claim, we have um, this operator s square minus lambda square i applied on v naught gives you the zero vector. Right, and for this, uh, remember that the operators form an algebra over R, right? So we can do the some somehow like a difference of square you've seen before, right? You see in high school, like we could just do this on operators. Thus, um, you could just verify, expand and verify. This is not hard, and we have this gives you the zero vector, right? Right, which means that this gives you the zero vector. Okay, 
Now, if this is zero vector already, then lambda is an eigenvalue of s, right? Why? Because v naught is unit vector, so it's not a zero vector, right? And okay, if it is not equal to zero, like the inside thing is not equal to zero, then this operator applied on this vector w gives you zero. Again, w, right? So um, let v1 equal to this quantity, right? Let uh, not, not the quantity, the vector. Let this equal to v1, but v1 is not equal to zero, right? By assumption. So v1 is an <laughs> uh, eigenvector for s with respect to the scalar lambda. Uh, I mean, negative lambda. Right, so negative lambda is negative. So no matter what, positive negative lambda is an eigenvalue of s. Right, since v1 is not zero. So here is the main lemma we gonna need. Right. So let me just repeat this. Give it a finite dimensional inner product space, and fix an operator that is self adjoint. Then s has an eigenvalue. Guaranteed to be have an eigenvalue. In complex field, it gets easier, but it is for the next lecture. And uh, so he, now is finally the important real spectral theorem. I spelled it wrong. Spectral. The real real spectral theorem. Okay. And uh, it's not the fake spectral theorem. And uh, we, so the statement is that, okay, given a uh, inner product space over R that is finite and dimensional, then an operator is self-adjoint if it only if there exists an orthonormal basis and a list of scalars such that uh, it's an orthonormal eigenbasis, right? Exists an orthonormal eigenbasis, which is all the good things we want. Right, such that T E I is lambda one E one T lambda uh, T E one is lambda one E one T E N is still lambda N E N where the dimension of V is equal to N. Okay, so uh, we've shown that uh, we show that um, we have one right, we have one uh, eigenvalue, right, and as you may guess, that the proof for uh, this is just by induction. The base case dimension of v is equal to one, right? If dimension of v is equal to one, then it is spanned by a single vector. We can just pick it as a unit vector; it doesn't matter at all. So T E I is n v, right? So in, if it's n v, then it's equal to some lambda one e one for the lambda one equal to r. So the base case follows immediately, and now we suppose that the Statement holds for dimension with equal to one, blah blah blah, until n minus one. For n is greater than equal to two, right? Because we proved n equal to one. So suppose that all the uh n one to n minus one holds, and then we want to show that this implies that n holds. The statement holds when it is equal to n, right? So first, by a lemma, right? We know that all the self-adjoint operator has an uh, eigenvalue, right? Now we just name this lambda equal as lambda n, right? Mm -hmm. And and then we let um we scale it, we scale this v such as a unit vector, okay? And then we consider the span of E n, right? Now this space is invariant under T, which is easy to see. And the dimension of W is equal to one, which is again easy to see. Now v is finite dimensional, w is also finite dimensional, right? Dimension is equal to one. So we consider its orthogonal decomposition. We write v as a direct sum of its w and w perp. Dimension w perp is then equal to n minus one. Boom, here's the punch. So, and we also know that by lemma, w perp is invariant under t. Again, another punch. And then we know that the restricted operator t tilde, restricted on the w perp, right? We have t is self-adjoint and t tilde is equal to t tilde star, right? This is all by the above established uh, established statements. So here's the third punch. So now we can, by inductive hypothesis, 
there exists E1, EN of the maze where the root perb and n minus 1, such as T tilde, right? T, we're talking about the, the operator on W perb, right? So we just work with T tilde. T tilde EI is equal to lambda EI for I is 1 to n minus 1, right? But for I from 1 to n minus 1, we know that all the EI is in W perp. EI is in W perp. So T tilde EI is really just T EI. So T tilde EI is T EI. T EI is equal to lambda, oh, sorry, lambda I EI. Right? There's a typo here. Lambda I EI. Right? You, you get the uh, meaning, right? Lambda I EI. So for i from 1 to n minus 1. And we also know that, um, right, uh, call this en, right? So we also, so we have this for 1 to n, which is the already the condition we want, right? Already the condition we want. The, the last thing I want to show that is that it is an orthonormal basis of v, which is again easy because e1, e minus 1 is the ortho basis of v because E n is in W, right? E n is in W, and they're in W perp, so that this is an orthogonal system, and each of them has norm is equal to one. So it is an orthonormal system. An orthonormal system with length n is independent. Independent, which means that um, they're independent, but the dimension of V is also equal to n. Right, so they're necessarily become a basis. So this is the uh, first implication. And so thus we show this direction, right? And to show this direction is actually easier. Is that, okay, if we, if we have, suppose we have this, right? Then if you know matrix, you know that this means that T has a diagonal matrix with respect to some orthonormal basis of V, right? The diagonal matrix is equal to its transpose, right? Because if you have a diagonal matrix, you, you flip the rows and columns, it remains the same. It is like some symmetry, right? I.e., we know that the transpose is the matrix of T star, right? It's the matrix of T star. Thus, uh, with, respect to some, with respect to the same orthonormal basis, so... This means that they have the same matrix, which means that they are the same operator. Okay, so this is really the the real spectral theorem. It's a very strong one. And this is the operator point of view. Now we're gonna view it in terms of matrices. Because linear algebra has two parts, right? We study the operators first, and then we study the, the sides of matrices. And because matrices are somehow just faster to compute, right? So let's give some definition and notations. AT is the transpose of A. And we say A matrix is symmetric if A is equal to its transpose. And we said A is orthogonal if A times A transpose is equal to I and is equal to A transpose times A. Okay, so just some basic definitions. Now, the lemma states that, okay, we equip Rn with the standard inner product on it. And we're given a matrix with real entries. Recall the left multiplication operator, right? Recall this operator. Then the lemma states that for any x, y, we have L, A, x, y equals to x, L, A transpose, y. And the proof is by direct computation, which is really long. Um, oh, right, so it's pretty long, so... Here's the uh, detail. So first compute LAX. LAX is just A times X, right? We write X in terms of the, the standard ordered basis, right? It is the default basis when we consider RN. It's the standard, or, uh, standard ordered basis. So A times X, right, is equal to this, believe it or not. And uh, we take the inner product with Y gives you this, right? A y1 times this plus y plus blah, 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 plus yn times this. And a transpose times y, right? Really easy, we just flip this, right? We just 
we just flip those, right? And x and a transpose y is equal to x1 of this until xn of this. Now, it is really just x1 of, right, a2, one, a n1, and plus x2 of a1, 2, 2, 2, a n2. Xn of a one n a two n a n n, right? And notice the y ones here and the y twos here and until the y ends here we group in out, right? It's going to y one of this 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 right until this and blah 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 and they are precisely equal to, right? This is really just this and yeah, it's just by direct computation. Okay. And here is the second lemma, which is again by direct computation, uh, which is left for the viewer to do it. It is my assignment, so if I can do it, you can do it, right? And um, again, we we quit with the standard inner product. We let vi denote the ith row and wj because denotes the jth column, and the lemma states that the following equivalent: we said a is the orthogonal matrix. If and only if. The rows form an orthonormal basis for Rn, and if it only if the columns for forms an orthonormal basis for Rn. Okay, so I'll assume this fact. Okay, the proof is, um, so the way I prove it is I just prove A equivalent to B and A equivalent to C, right? And notice how you multiply matrices, which is really, you can relate it to inner product and a Euclidean inner product or say the dot product, whatever you want to say. So the theorem is that, well, motivated by the real spectral theorem, given a symmetric matrix, then there exists a diagonal matrix such that the lambda one is blah, 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 greater, greater than to lambda n, and an orthogonal matrix such that A is equal to U, D, U, T, transpose. Okay, orthogonal means that U, T is equal to U negative one, right? So basically, it means that A is similar to a diagonal matrix via orthogonal matrix, right? So this is just uh, the theorem in uh, real, real cases and the point of view of matrices. And the proof, we're going to use all the lemma we established. So Um, well, at LA denote the left multiplication operator, right, induced by A. So by lemma, we have this, right? Thus, we have AT is equal to LA, a joint, right? But AT is equal to A, right? Because we, we assume that A is symmetric, right? AT is equal to A, so LA is a self-adjoint. LA is self-adjoint. As... L is of a joint, so by the spectral theorem. Hello? So, given a self adjoint operator on a finite dimensional vector space with the inner product, right, we can pick an orthonormal basis of Rn such that we have this. Okay, so why? So, what can we do after this? Now, by the well ordering principle, right? Okay, well, by by the equivalence of axiom of choice and well ordering principle, right? So, okay, I'm just yapping right now. Um, we can arrange them, right? So we let D be the matrix, right? And we let U be the, the matrix of Z1 to Zn. Okay. Now, by a lemma, U is orthogonal. Why? Because the columns, right? The columns forms an orthonormal basis. Implies that U is orthogonal. The columns form an orthonormal basis, U is orthogonal. And then we observe that LU of EI gives you ZI, right? And we claim that LUT ZI gives you EI. Well, indeed, because U is invertible. So LU is invertible, right? Why is you orthogonal? Orthogonal means invertible, right? U invertible, which means that LU is invertible, right? By linear algebra, like we, we've done this already. So we have 
And we also have this formula, right? Which is, we've done this also. We have done this already. So this means that ut is u negative 1, which gives you this. But l u e i gives you z i. Well, by the definition of inverse function, right? This z i should give you e i. inverse function so now we have this we let b equal to this matrix so l b z i gives you l this z i which gives you this z i well this gives you what e i right yeah negative one right uh gives you e i l d e i gives you lambda i e i Right, um, because this, this matrix right gives you lambda i e i. Oh yeah, we move it in front. L u e i. Z i, so lambda i z i equals to L a z i. So L a is equal to L b, which means that a is equal to b. So, yeah, that's really it. And uh, next time we're gonna talk about the complex spectral theory. And see you guys next time.